Hello everybody, you're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound, I'm your host Dane Cobain. This is the weekly radio show where we chat about the local arts news, we have a different guest on each week, we head over to the Rye Light Zone for a short story and or some poetry, we play local unsigned and or independent music and we catch up with Twangling Jack Ford over in the Oak Shed for a weekly album review. As always you can reach out to me here at the studio on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk, that's d-a-n-e dot c-o-b-a-i-n at wickhamsound.org.uk and I'm particularly keen to hear from poets, performers, musicians, people with mp3s, to share, people with stories to share, don't hesitate to get in touch. You can also find us on Facebook if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound, you should be able to find us. And we're repeating on Wickham Sound on Monday nights, we're on iTunes, Spotify and wherever else you get your podcasts. Uh, yes, this week we are going to be chatting to uh, Simon Carter of Humans Can't Reboot, but before we do that, we are going to head over to the Rye Light Zone now to catch up with Twanglin' Jack Ford for his latest instalment in his My Musical Journey series. At the start of the 80s, my band The Chevrons had lost our star female singer, our other female singer, and had all our guitars stolen, including my Gibson SG and Shergold Masquerader. This just left Gary on lead vocals and rhythm guitar, Brian on bass, Neil on drums and me. The first thing we did was to buy cheaper guitars, and then recruit a stunningly glamorous singer called Maxine. We had a jerky post-punk sound that worked quite well with Maxine, though we probably wanted to be Blondie. may even have eventually become better than our previous incarnation had we not inexplicably also recruited a sax player called Ralph. We assumed Ralph would get better, but we were wrong. I say inexplicably, but the word that really comes to mind is madness. And possibly Clarence Clemens. There was a lot of sax back then. Ironically, we went on to play better venues. We supported a heavy rock boogie band at the Music Machine. We were the headline act when a tour of unsigned bands played the Rock Garden and we continued to be popular at the John Bull in Chiswick. We journeyed to Bishop Stortford to play with a prog rock band we had been friends with. We drove to the Kent coast, to the Isle of Sheppey, where we supported a band that were quite well known and went on to have success in the USA. But my memory of that day was of us trying to amuse ourselves in a depressing closed down out of season seaside town. We also played an outside gig for Friends of the Earth performing on top of some ruins. But my memory of that day was of trying to get lunch in a depressing provincial concrete shopping centre. When Brian left to get married I think I took it as a sign that growing up was in some way now inevitable. We were joined by Ginge on bass. Like Ralph the sax player, he was in the RAF stationed at North Holt. Ginge managed to get us into the RAF camp regularly to rehearse in the stores he ran, and after the rehearsals we would drink in the naffy. We had a booking to hire our PA out to a band called the Mighty Stripes, and told to meet in Hyde Park. I took Ralph and Ginge to help. We found ourselves on a float going down Oxford Street, The two members of Her Majesty's forces who were with me were slightly concerned that we were heading a protest against the Nationalities Bill. They were even more worried when it turned out we had been seen on the Tea Time News. Only a small part of being in a band is about playing songs to audiences. It is about loading and unloading, driving for hours with just tapes of The Clash and The Doors, cutting out and sticking together cardboard pick sleeves for our single, while laughing at jokes no one else would get. It is about fixing an exhaust with coat hanger wire, mending guitar strings by winding the long bit onto the ball with pliers, 
and mending leads with soldering irons. It is about throwing your guitar in the air at the end of the set, having just spewed out fake blood, and then having to fix the electrics with gaffer tape and wipe away the real blood left behind when you shredded your fingers on the strings, too pumped with adrenaline to notice. It is about taking your records to the record exchange to buy cassettes for demos and then copying them and writing on the sleeves. It is about keeping a business-like operation on the road when you are in your early 20s and some of your staff are still at school. It is about waiting for the AA or waiting in A&E and then sleeping in the van. Ginge got us a gig in his hometown of Burnley. We got booked to do another gig lunchtime the following day. But Ginge got beaten up for having Cockney mates. So my memory of that weekend was the camaraderie of the late night wait in A&E. It is about getting in at four and leaving for work at seven, working temp jobs and sharing the kitchen porter duties with guys from other bands, or signing on, and sometimes straining the kindness of strangers to get a drink in the pub you are playing in. It is about parking next to an abandoned van, and when your mates are setting up the PA you are liberating the whole exhaust system. Or it is about starting out with a push because you've got no starter motor and then parking on hills to get going again. It is about the arguments, the compromises and the collaboration where your idea for a song becomes real and people clap. It is about being in the race, being part of a scene, being listed in Melody Maker and NME, being booked to play at functions in hotels and marquees. We did a gig for Rock Against Racism in the hall above The Undertakers in Wealdstone. Every young man probably feels the primitive urge to be in a hunting party. I would never have got picked for a sports team, but I had been a patrol leader in the Scouts. The Chevrons was a hunting party. A hunt for fame and notoriety at the same time. I seemed to be in a constant state of fury whilst also being the quiet one who only started playing to overcome his shyness and to get girls. But I never got girls and I shied away at the end of the set, doing the takedown or just sitting in the dressing room. I wrote a song about fighting our way through the hardships, hopefully to success. But one night in a prefab social club in Hillingdon, some skinheads heard it and started to follow us. They would come to our gigs and shout out for us to play that fighting song. This was not something we particularly wanted. It did not end with a bang. There was no big decision, tearful last waltz, or protracted animosity. It no longer felt like the Chevrons. So towards the end we renamed ourselves the Wailing Pumas. I got a porter studio and a drum machine which were becoming a thing. I recorded demos with Gary and Denny, our old bass player, manager and driver, now playing keyboards. Neil the drummer joined a more successful band that had won the Melody Maker contest and was sponsored by a leisure wear company. Gary and I went to see him support Katrina and the Waves at the Marquee in Wardour Street. Gary and I helped build a 24-track studio in Walthamstow in exchange for being able to record a whole album's worth of songs. We were sort of intending to do something a bit Northern Soul. Hold on, hold on baby, you're moving much too fast Hold on 
final attempt at a band had been called Gary South and the Prisoners of Rock and Roll. It was a bit Bruce, a bit Southside Johnny. We had horns. It was a bit Dexy's Midnight Runners, oh Gino. We rehearsed the songs we were going to record in a rehearsal room in King's Cross, sounding a bit like this. <laughs> But our urge to make a jangling sound won out, and on the recordings we called ourselves the Chevrons again. At the time I worked in the warehouse of a bedroom furniture company. A design fault in the wardrobe doors meant there were always broken mirrors, which would have ended up in a skip had I not, whilst fitting windows in the studio, learnt how to cut glass. I would regularly travel the North Circular with my pieces of broken mirror, and I would often stop and buy a cassette for the journey. I remember buying the Eurythmics album, the one with Here Comes the Rain Again, and I remember buying the latest Slade album. But then I gave in to an urge I had had since childhood, and I bought the cast recording of West Side Story. I was becoming more interested in working in the studio than playing live, and I did not want to keep writing jangly pop songs. I wanted to write a musical. During my day job to pass time, I would often flirt with the receptionist. I had no intention of pursuing a relationship with her, but one of the managers told me he thought her and I had something going and that I should ask her out. He became quite insistent. He told me I should do it as soon as I could because you never know what will happen. On the Friday, he called me into his office and told me I should really do it right away. He psyched me up and sent me away believing he must know something I did not. Maybe she had told him something. I asked her. She said no. I got called into the director's office and was given redundancy with two months' pay. I was due to go to the studio that night. Someone phoned to check I was coming. I told them what had happened and a night out on the town was planned. In the early hours of the morning I went to bed in the studio and stayed there for nearly a year. That was Twanglin' Jack Ford with the latest instalment in his My Musical Journey series. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain.
Machine by Humans Can't Repair. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dan Cobain, and I'm joined here in conversation now by Simon Carter from Humans Can't Reboot. <laughs> the first question is one you may or may not have an answer to, uh, but I ask everybody, it's kind of a tradition, which is, uh, what was the last book that you read and what did you think of it? Uh, the last book I read was um, Frank Herbert's June. Nice. Um, and, and yeah, I, re- I really enjoyed it, actually. Um, I, I, I thought I was going to struggle because it's a bit yeah. of a monster. Um, and of course it has its own sort of terminology, Mm -hmm. um, but I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I, I really enjoyed it and, um, I've tempted to read some of the follow-ups um, yeah. or maybe even reread uh, that, that the original because I, I thought it was very good, very good. Awesome. It's funny. So um, I've I've actually, I've read, uh, I read the original June books, the original like six Frank Herbert ones. Yeah. And I've not, not long since finished reading all of the Brian Herbert and Kevin J. Anderson ones. Yes. As well, which which a lot of people, right. a lot of people say they're not very good, but I actually really enjoyed them. Um, I actually got, as you can see, I've got a tattoo that says fear is the mind killer. Uh, so, <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> so yeah, I'm, I w- even then I wouldn't say I'm like a huge Dune fan, but it's, uh, uh, well, I suppose I am since reading the, the full series, but um, that particular quote and like the fear litany, uh, I related to that a lot because I have anxiety. Um, yes. So I found, found myself, I memorized that. And so there've been times like a great example is like, I went to the dentist to have some, to have like a root canal done, horrible treatment takes forever. So I was just lying there, just going through the fear litany in my head to kind of get me through it. So 
Yeah, I've cool. done exactly the same. <laughs> funny enough, I, when I have to start to do like a blood test or something yeah. like that, I'm not not keen on it. I yeah. over in my head, I just think, you know, fear, fear is the mind killer. I will not fear, <laughs> and, yeah. it, and it does awesome. help. It does. Yeah, help. <laughs> yeah, it takes your mind off it, doesn't it? Cool. Yeah. Okay. So obviously today, I want to mostly talk about you, to talk to you about your music, um, and you're involved in a, a few different projects, I think. Um, so, but I wanted to know mainly. So, can you tell us a little bit about Humans Can't Reboot, and uh, including like where the name comes from and your approach to making music under that name? Yeah. So obviously, that's that's the that's the band that I um, that I send you the stuff for, mm-hmm. um, and and actually the reason being is when I started out making me I started out making music when I was about 12 in, in my mm-hmm. bedroom um it's so accessible these days to kids um but I, I started making a lot of electronic music and the whole and I, I was doing quite well with sort of um dark underground dance genres um the whole reason then that humans can't reboot came about is I also enjoy writing lyrics and mm-hmm it's a different kind of genre and I thought you know what I made, I made all this music but I, I don't have any music that I can play for my family yeah. <laughs> so the whole point of humans coming was you know I want to do something fun that's actually accessible to everyone and anyone you know it's 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 well it's more poppy it's you yeah. know to, to, to be blunt it's 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 family friendly it's a lot of synth pop um electro pop and and that's uh that's really how that came about um and so i I started looking uh for a for a singer um and i found uh, amy haman who's a she's 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 a popular girl because she does a lot of um session singing so she's she's often all around the world doing these playing these bars and whatnot um doing often covers covers of Mm. you know famous pop songs um so she can be quite hard to pin down but she has a fantastic voice and i i and i work with her really well um so yeah that's that's how it came about with that the name i came up with the name um i was scratching my head for ages and there was sort of a i don't know a hint of melancholy to the name and i thought you know that 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 matches me as a person and yeah. and i think it sort of sort of a lot of the songs aren't they might have that happy upbeat synth pop vibe but if you listen to the lyrics there is mm. a bit of melancholy going on there yeah, yeah. And I suppose it's also kind of a callback almost to, again, the electronic style that you use. It's kind of, it kind of highlights that in a way as well, because, you know, when you think of, the, when you have the term humans can't reboot, to me, I automatically think, well, like, like computers and robots and yes. things like that. So it's kind of, it's a nice little touch there. I think it kind of bridges the gap between the human side and the electronic side, you know? It does, and I've ha- I've had several comments. Um, I mean, I, I was lucky that when I came up with the name, it, it wasn't taken. I mean, yeah. That's the first one. No, no one else had used it, and I have had several comments about, "Oh wow, I'm not too keen on the music, but I love the band name." Yeah. <laughs> well, awesome. You've got to take what you can, what you can, can't you? Yeah, true. Cool. So, and your Facebook page because you've got it says like humans can't reboot, and then slash narconic and slash sdkrtr, right? So are those are yeah. are those some of your other sort of other they pseudonyms? Are some of my other. Yes, they are some of my other pseudonyms. Um, my narconic one is is more uh, trance, um, and the SDKRTR one was sort of um, uh, a bit. That was that was almost the evolution. That was before mm. humans can't reboot. I was sort of starting to go into this more friendly pop um, era, um, and and I often uh, also release under my own real name, which yeah. um, uh, sometimes I think was a fantastic other idea and other times i think why didn't i use something that people can't track me down with yeah yeah it's um it's good fun though and and it's it's hard keeping up with all the different projects but it's good because sometimes you know you know you know yourself when you're a creative person you think oh i want to do this i want to go in that direction sometimes you wake up in the morning think no i just don't fancy that but i do fancy a bit of this and then it gives me that creative outlet to go do you know what where does this song fit actually it's a it's a bit darker i can slide it into this other project yeah yeah, it's it's good fun it kind of reminds me so i mean i i don't personally do this but a lot of the writers that i know um they will they have their different pen names for different genres Mm. and that sometimes they're quite close like i have one who uh one friend she writes like sort of young adult fantasy and then she has like fantasy romance and she kind of separates the two because they have different reader bases but she'll have some, something similar to that where she's like, I've got this really good idea. So now I need to decide, is it going to be straight up fantasy or am I going to have some romance elements to it? And then that kind of then determines which name she puts it out under. Um, so I think it's quite common un- under like a lot of different 
you know it's not just a musical thing i i, I see like writers doing that and i guess to a lesser extent artists sometimes do that as well but i think in music and and writing in particular it seems quite common i think so yeah i mean yeah, as you know you said we, we sort of pour our souls into this and and you don't always know where it's going to land exactly yeah. yeah cool awesome so how how do you approach making music what's some of the uh, software that you use um well i uh, often use cubase uh, that that's my go to um i've started dabbling with with some of the others as well um a bit of fruity loops and um uh, some of the other ones but cubase is my go-to um it, it is a good question and it's an interesting question i'll tell you why because um I, and i i know this for a fact i i make music the wrong way around <laughs> um and this is where amy is a star because most everyone almost everyone that you speak to that makes music when they're making a vocal track they will make the instrumental first yeah then you've got the melodies and everything then you know, you know a vocalist can go over the top and start i write my own lyrics so i've sort of got the melodies in my head then i try to create the track and then i do an awful version with my own voice to amy to say you know can we can we, can we work yeah. with this and and then she's a star and she always manages to to make it work in the end but i know how much of a pain that is for any vocalist because yeah. normally it's instrumental first then vocals i i, I tend to do it um, a bit back to front and I, i'm aware of that <laughs> well that that just speaks as well though to her, like adapt adaptability and professionalism and stuff as well and i suppose a lot of that comes from her background being a session musician but I guess yeah. like everybody works in different ways. And I suppose the mark of a good session musician is the ability to adapt the way you work to whoever you have to Abs be working with. Absolutely. She loves it. And she's very lucky that she, she can do it. Um, it, it is her profession. Um, she's, she's in some fantastic cover bands that really go all around the world. So she's very lucky that, yeah, that, that is her job. Yeah. Cool. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain. I'm here in conversation with Simon Carter from Humans Can't Reboot. And this is Humans Can't Reboot with Broken Promise. The words you spoke, we had our homes, made our plans, your in our hands. You promised me we would always be together, no matter, forever.
And now it's time for us to be joined, rejoined in conversation by Simon Carter from Humans Can't Reboot. And you know, you mentioned that you write the lyrics. Does she ever have any input? Does she ever like contribute, or is it very much a case of <laughs> these are the lyrics, <laughs> take it or it's leave it? It's another good question, um, and I'll tell you why. Because um, I, I, I'm always, in, I, I'm, I, I'm always encouraging her, saying, "If you've got input, please, yeah. please, you know, throw some ideas at her." And um, she's, she's so nice. She's so reluctant to change my words. And yeah. sometimes I'll make, I'll, I'll make a mistake, or I'll, I'll reread it, and I think, "Hang on, that makes nonsense," because yeah. you know, verse one or whatever. And um, but she won't say anything. And I, I could tell you some funny examples where I've received demos, and I've because I've written the songs from my perspective, though I think we, I did a song called uh, it, "It Was It Was Man, Not Machine," and of course she sang it back, and I thought this is odd with her saying "man, not machine." So yeah. let's just change it to "girl, not machine." Yeah. And you sing it, and then it works. There are a couple of those I think. Hang on, but she won't change. She just no matter how much I encourage yeah. her, she she sticks to my lyrics uh, <laughs> to the letter. <laughs> yeah. Cool, awesome. And have you worked with any other acts over the years? And like, maybe were there vocalists you worked with before you settled on Amy? Uh, yes, yes, I've worked with quite a few. Um, Amy was the first one from the UK, though. Um, mm. And I'd I'd worked with an Italian singer, um, a female vocalist uh, called Naomi Aurora. She she was quite good. Um, and I'd and I'd previously worked with uh, some other singers from from across Europe, mostly. Um, and whilst it can have its charm when they're singing in English, they've got their their, their accent, and mm. that can have its charm. For this po- project, I really wanted a native English speaker to, yeah. you know, so that so that the words were were really enunciated and people could understand what what the lyrics were. Um, and just touching on that, my very latest release with Humans Can't Be Boot, because Amy is forever so busy i have had a guest vocalist um who from america um so another native english speaker um but she's quite big um in in the sort of synth wave scene over there uh called megan mcduffie and she's she's done vocals for the very the latest uh humans can't we boot single uh called to the sky cool Awesome. And do you ever like perform live or is it just sort of studio work that you do? It's mostly studio work. We, we, we'd we love to. And like I say, if you could tie Amy down, yeah. uh, if, but if during her times in the UK, it, it would be nice. Um, but it is very hard getting our yeah. diaries to match up, sadly. Yeah, cool. No worries. OK, so I wanted to ask you, uh, and I suppose this is a broader question. What, what are some of the musical acts who've influenced you over the years? So maybe like who's influenced you through each of your different sort of musical stylings and phases? Yeah, well, that's, that's a good question. I mean, thinking of Humans Caribou, I, I just really wanted to go down this synth pop, electro pop avenue. I think I was listening to to a lot of that 80s stuff at the time, you know, um, that bit of Erasia and, uh, and well, anything really with, with Vince Clark in. I, I think he's, he's a fantastic um, synth player, or just a fantastic musician. Um and and that that sort of vibe, anything like that, and that's that definitely influenced the humans can't reboot stuff. Um, with my narconic project, I was listening to a lot of nineties trance, and I sort of started trying to emulate some of that. Um, and then with my stuff that I released under my own name, which is more it's 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 more techno industrial. I I started you know that that sort of stems from a lot of uh, the. Uh, sort of front 242 and the the, the belgian bands from the mm. late 80s early 90s um so yeah i think i think they're probably my main influences awesome cool and uh in terms of like music do you do you just produce music electronically or do you play any instruments i only produce electronically i mean i can play uh, a keyboard yeah um and and i use a keyboard when i'm when i'm uh, producing uh, and and when i if i when i do do the occasional live thing um obviously i have my laptop with packing tracks and whatnot but i yeah. i will take uh, i will take a little synth with me and 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 you know make make an effort to show that i'm not stood there just pressing play yeah 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 cool awesome and i wondered like I guess this is an interesting one for you because you've talked as well. Obviously, you, you you write the lyrics and there's a heavy emphasis on the lyrics. What is generally more important to you? Is, is it the music or the lyrics or does it depend upon, you know, which, you know, which name you're writing under? 
well that, that is a fantastic question um that and uh, yeah i guess you could say it depends upon which name i'm writing when i do my own stuff the under my own name the lyrics are usually shorter mm. blunter um much less uh interest they're just a catchy you know couple of sentences if anything but with humans can't reboot it really is the lyrics i focused heavily on trying to produce well-written songs yeah um and then the music comes along after that and hopefully one or two of the tracks are, have got catchy you know <laughs> tunes yeah. to go along with them um and sometimes it, it it does it does come together um when I, I think particularly on that first album lost soul i think um lost soul the, the title track uh it was was quite deep um a lot going on there with the piano and the guitar and then um also um fallen angel was was also a, a deep song yeah um, yeah where it where the lyrics and the music they they really match well yeah well that's it and they can kind of work together as well and i mean i suppose with with humans can't reboot it's almost like the lyrics are, are pretty much telling a story whereas mm -hmm. i guess with some of your other projects it's more like they're like an additional instrument rather than yeah. anything else absolutely i'd agree with that 100 percent. yeah cool so what are some like non-musical things that inspire you Oh, that's a good question. It's a hard one as well. It is. It's a really hard one. Yeah, non-musical things that inspire me. Well, um, I, I I do like my, um, you know, it's, I, I like uh, TV and cinema and anything that's artistic. Um, a good book, as you say, um, and you do get inspiration. You do. I mean, sometimes I'll be sat there watching a TV show or reading a book, and you and you read a line, and you just think, "Wow, that's." That's yeah. a really powerful line. You think, how can I, it inspires me. How can I use that to create perhaps a song around it? But of course, not just steal the line. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you, you, want, you still want it to have your own influence. Um, but yeah, I would say those are the, the things that they, they can really inspire you sometimes. It's, yeah, you just see, you see a clip or you, you read a line, you think, I, I really need to sit down and try and write something around that idea. It can really yeah. spiral out of control, as I'm sure you know. Yeah. Well, I guess a lot of that is like serendipity as well, is you just yes. come across something by accident and you're like, oh my God, I need to use that in a song. Um, Absolutely. So I, I guess yeah. it kind of comes down to almost, surround again, surrounding yourself in those things that do inspire you and then being receptive so that when something does come your way, you can sort of take it and run with it. Absolutely. It's the age old thing, isn't it? You know, like surrounding yourself with good people and good things yeah. happen. It, it's like that. If you if you really dive deep into other people's art, you will find something that inspires you. Yeah, for sure. Cool. Um, do you have any other artistic hobbies, like any photography or filmmaking or anything like that? Or is it just the music for you? It's really just the music. I mean, it would be handy if I did do uh, if I could make music videos, but yeah. <laughs> but unfortunately not. Um no, that there that music is the main outlet. I used to try and write short stories, um, science uh, often sci-fi short mm. stories, um, but I just haven't found the time to do that in, in years. You know, music has become such a dominant force; it, it's really taken my free time. Yeah, yeah, and that's not a bad thing as well. And you can sort of play to your strengths and your passions as well. So, um, okay, cool. I wanted, and you kind of mentioned you've had some nice feedback about the band name, but I wondered what's some of the best feedback in general you've received along the way. Um, I, I yeah had some uh, lovely comments, um, particularly and and what's really nice, and I had one. Uh, it was only last month, uh, completely out of the blue. It, in, it arrived in my uh, inbox, and it just said, um, "Love this track." It was uh, it was the uh, it was nuclear love. They said, "Love this track." Um, can I submit it to a, a German record label for a compilation album? Yeah okay yeah sure fine go for it and and they wrote uh, wrote back the record label i think was, was consume records and and they they loved it and they're going to put it on a compilation uh nice. it's coming out at the end of this month on awesome. cd so i thought oh lovely so sometimes you just get things out of the blue like that and yeah. that is a lovely compliment when someone likes something so much that they said you know what i've sent it off to a guy i know yeah and, wow fantastic well, and, and they've, they've kind of like sort of stuck their own neck out in a way to promote you as well um because obviously that's going to reflect on them like if the record label turns absolutely out, this, is, this is terrible then they're not yep. going to trust them the next time they go to them you know so. yes absolutely so yes it's, it's touching when someone does something like that yeah yeah awesome
Cool. Um, and just sort of one fight. Well, it's two questions in one to end on, which is uh, what's next for you? So what have you got planned for the rest of 2023? And where can people follow you to find out more and stay up to date? Yeah. So for the rest of this year, um, I have got a uh, album hopefully coming out under my uh, Simon Carter name. That's because, um, well, it's it's been long overdue. It's, it's going to be a, an interesting album. Um, I'm working with a, a German girl on that and it's going to be based around um, witchiness, witch things, mm. witchy things. So let's try and get that out before Halloween or something like that. Yeah, that should yeah. be interesting. Um, as for Humans Can't Reboot, I have written um, another album. I've done most of the tracks. I've got the lyrics, but... Um, tying amy down is is proving difficult so maybe don't expect to see that uh this year but hopefully next year that would be fantastic um so yeah i'd say that's what's going to be taking up my time for the next uh 12 months or so cool. um and yeah they uh, people can follow me on uh i think facebook's usually the easiest these days um of course i've got Bang Camp and Spotify and iTunes and, and all the rest of it. Um, but I often find Facebook still the easiest, you know, for tagging and whatnot. Yeah. Awesome. Big thank you to Simon Carter from Humans Can't Reboot for being this week's guest. You're listening to The Archer on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and this is Humans Can't Reboot with Lost in Space. <laughs>
That was Lost in Space by Humans Can't Reboot. You're listening to The Art Show on 106.6 FM Wickham Sound. I'm your host, Dane Cobain, and it's time for us to head over to the Elk Shed now to catch up with Twangling Jack Ford for this week's album review. Gentle Giant Octopus. One of my favourite psychedelic singles is Kites by Simon Dupre and the Big Sound, a band that was basically three brothers, and none were called Simon, and their surname was not Dupre. They were one-hit wonders, though they did make other records. At the end of the 60s, the three brothers joined up with a keyboard wizard, a guitarist and a drummer, and they all became Gentle Giant. The early Gentle Giant albums have a slightly spooky, otherworldly sound, certainly like nothing else around at the time. And their later albums tried to be more like the conventional progressive rock of the time, and even more commercial but I think they were at their peak on the album Octopus. They named it Octopus because it is an opus in eight parts and it is the last to feature all three brothers. Personally, I feel that progressive rock became less inventive as technology improved. This album came out in 1972, when if you wanted a thing to sound like a violin, what you really needed was a violin. That was lucky for Gentle Giant, because the thing that sets them apart is the way they could play so many instruments between them. So they could perform as a string ensemble one minute and a loud rock band the next. They could do this change over live and the Stephen Wilson remix of Octopus has a live medley of songs from Octopus as a bonus track. Progressive rock often seems to me to be about making things unnecessarily complicated trying every patch on the synth and playing fast in odd time signatures. Gentle Giant's music does all that, but everything seems to be a vital part of the piece, and not just everyone getting a go at showing off. They had very distinctive, almost medieval-sounding harmony vocals. There are songs that contain pastoral string passages, much like Vaughan Williams or Elgar, Yet there are other songs that feature musical passages of rapid fire flurries of notes, almost Mahavishnu orchestral in nature. The best known song off the album is probably Knots. Knots is based on a book of the same name written by Scottish psychiatrist R.D. Lang. It has choral singing that reminded me a bit of Philip Glass's Einstein on the Beach. This is regularly interrupted by jarring percussive sounds and instrumental breaks with interesting and sometimes challenging harmonies. But for me, the standout track is Think of Me with Kindness, a song that when you recall it, you remember a sweet melody and moving lyric. But when you actually listen to it, you hear something much more complex. You will hear intricate counterpoint with different instruments adding colour and texture, which pretty much sums up the whole of Octopus by Gentle Giant. Big thank you to Twangle and Jack Ford for this week's album review. Thank you to Simon Carter from Humans Can't Reboot for being this week's guest. Uh, thank you to everyone whose music I've shared. As always, you can reach out to us here at the studio by dropping me a line on dane.cobain at wickhamsound.org.uk. That's D-A-N-E dot C-O-B-A-I-N at wickhamsound.org.uk. I'm particularly keen to hear from poets, performers, musicians, people with MP3s to share, people with local arts news. Don't hesitate to get in touch. You can also find us on Facebook if you search for The Art Show on Wickham Sound. You should be able to find us. And we repeat on Wickham Sound on Monday nights. We're on the Wickham Sound Listen Again. We're on iTunes, Spotify, and wherever else you get your podcasts. So I'm going to leave you with one last tune, and that is What If by Bitterroot. I'll see you next week.
something wrong.